Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Dale Scully. I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs, and I have the honor of reading the land acknowledgement statement tonight. We acknowledge that we gather as the University of Crookston on the traditional land and water of the Anishinaabe and Dakota people, past and present, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have served as caretakers of Mother Earth throughout the generations. We acknowledge the genocide and systems of oppression that have deprived indigenous people of their lands, and we honor and respect the diverse and beautiful peoples still connected to this land. We recognize the many contribution, many contributions Native nations have made as the spiritual and physical caretakers of this land. We acknowledge the histories and cultural traditions that make the ceded and treaty lands special and celebrate the talents and gifts of indigenous populations of our region. With this land acknowledgement, we affirm the inherent sovereignty of native nations. We strive to hold our university accountable to indigenous peoples and pledge to support and advocate for their welfare. The University of Minnesota Crookston stands with the community members of native nations and commits to building relationships with the American Indian communities through partnerships, academic pursuits, historical recognitions, and recruitment efforts to further our commitment to promoting diversity and to create an equitable and inclusive future for this region. Thank you. Next, I would like to in, um, introduce Dr. Chancellor Mary Holtz Claus. Thank you, Ray, and welcome to everybody tonight. So it's so, so great to be able to be here and to honor our brave men and women who put their lives on hold to serve the greater good and uphold the freedoms that we cherish in this country. I would like to ask everybody who uh, is a veteran if you would please stand so we could honor your service. Thank you so much. And I'd also like to acknowledge the family members who also have been so supportive of those uh, uh, sisters, brothers, daughters, sons, grandsons, granddaughters who joined the military and who were there to respect them and to help them and to support them through their military journey. So again, thank you to all of you. And I'd also like to acknowledge Senator Mark Johnson, who is our senator from this region. Mark, would you please stand? So thank you for your service, too. Wonderful uh, aspect of Northwest Minnesota is the great call to public service, uh, both in elected offices that many of you I know serve on, in the volunteer areas that you serve, and those of you who have served in the military. We also have here tonight with us some of our student veterans, and I know there's at least two out there. Would you please stand? Maybe there are three of you. Would you please stand so that we can recognize you? Thank you so much. So we have um, probably close to about 30 veterans on our campus. Some of them join us online, and some of them join us on person. But we have found so many strengths of having veterans as students. You know, one of the things about them is our veteran students come to us that they're really, a, they're already a product of an intense educational experience. There's almost no better leadership experiences, leadership development, and training than military service. They also bring to, with us a diversity of training and oftentimes a, dirt, a diverse perspective because they're serving with people from all over the country and so they learn to honor and respect one another and appreciate the diversity. 
They also bring a resilience and a train, they're trained problem solvers. So as I said, most of them have received a lot of leadership training. And they also have a lot of experience of working towards a mission and are, accomplished and are really focusing on accomplishing their academic goals. And then our students, our, our veteran students, our military students are service oriented. They frequently uh, probably volunteer more than any other student demographic that we have on here on campus. So to our soldiers, our sailors, our Marines, our airmen, our Coast Guardsmen who dedicated their lives to this country, we thank you. And again, to the families of our servicemen and women who've shared time with their loved ones for the betterment of our country, we thank you too. Your service will always be cherished and appreciated. I have a quote from Alexander Hamilton, which I think really um, exudes the, the essence of what it means to be an American. There's a certain enthusiasm in liberty that makes human nature rise above itself in acts of bravery and heroism. Thank you and welcome. If everyone could please stand for the
Color. Please be seated. Good evening. My name is Jamie Casavant, and my husband Bill and I do um, various ceremonies throughout the year. And tonight we are going to do the POW MIA Remembrance Table Ceremony. Before we begin, I would like to read a little history about it so that you understand the symbolism. The missing man table originated during the Vietnam War as a symbol of missing and captive service members. All known American prisoners of war, or POWs, were released in 1973 following the Paris Peace Agreement between North Vietnam, South Vietnam, and the United States. While the agreement ended the war, Open wounds were left in America's national consciousness. An unpopular war in America, the Vietnam War brought hard times to our veterans. The United States military sent to serve in Vietnam returned to a very unfriendly homeland that largely didn't honor their service and their sacrifice. A group called the Red River Valley Fighter Pilots Association, or as they called themselves, the River Rats, <laughs> set the first POW MIA table. During the Vietnam War, this daring group of airmen came from different branches of the America's armed forces. They took their name from missions flown into North Vietnam and the combat zones surrounding Hanoi along the Red River. The missions were dangerous and the pilots took strength from their brotherhood of courage and shared knowledge. In the spirit that that brotherhood made, the river rats pledged themselves to taking care of their own and having reunions once the war ended and all our POWs came home, but initially held practice reunions while still in Southeast Asia and America. It was at the first practice reunion that the first POW MIA table was set in remembrance of the fallen and missing comrades. Following the Vietnam War, the tradition of the remembrance table made its way into all military dining um, ceremonies. At these ceremonies, a series of toasts are made before being seated to eat with the last toast to remember until they all come home. And that is reserved for their comrades of the Vietnam POW MIA table. Sometimes the items on the table vary, but the ceremony is always a touching tribute to America's finest and bravest men and women, those who wait and hope and believe in the dream of freedom within every breath they take on foreign soil and whose memories live beyond the chains of their prisons. So tonight, this ceremony is rich in the military tradition as we honor those men and women of our armed forces who, in defense of the freedoms of our country and that of our free world, are unaccounted for and are classified as prisoners of war or missing in action. We will now set the table 
As you can see, the table is round to show that our concern for them is never ending. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms so that their children could remain free. Let us take a moment to remember the men and women prisoners of war from all branches of service that are too often forgotten. Now we will set the table. The lone candle symbolizes the frailty of a prisoner alone trying to stand up against his oppressors. The red ribbon on the candle reminds us of those who will not be coming home. The single red rose reminds us of the loved ones and families of our heroes and our comrades in arms who keep the faith and await their return. The yellow ribbon on the rose vase represents the love and support of our country, which inspired them to answer the nation's call. The red napkin stands for the emptiness these warriors have left in the hearts of their family and friends. A slice of lemon is placed on the plate to remind us of their bitter fate if we do not bring them home. The salt is shaken on the plate, symbolizing the family's tears as they wait and they remember. The glass is inverted, reminding us that our distinguished heroes and your comrades, friends, and neighbors cannot be with us to drink a toast or join in the festivities this evening. The faded picture that is placed on the table is a reminder that they are missed very much and are remembered by their families, friends, and comrades. The empty chair depicts an unknown face representing no specific soldier, sailor, airman, marine, or coast guardsman, but are all here with us this evening. Remember those whom we depended on in battle. They, depended, they depend on us now to bring them home. The POW MIA chair cover is placed on the chair to mourn the fact that many of our heroes will not return to, their, to our shores and to pay tribute to their passing. As we look upon this empty table, do not remember the ghosts from the past, but remember our heroes and our comrades. The American play is representing all those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for everyone here for our freedom. As we look upon this empty table, remember our heroes, their families, they all serve together. Remember those that our veterans had, I'm sorry, remember those that our veterans that came home depended on in battle. Now they depend on us. By setting this table tonight, we honor our military from all wars and all conflicts. Never forget their sacrifice. Never forget their family's sacrifice. At the end of this program tonight, the candle will be extinguished. Take that light with you. Keep it in your heart and remember.
made popular by the American country singer Billy Gilman and has been performed by a number of artists. Our, our second selection is entitled The City Called Heaven and will feature the soloist Connor Rose. This is an African American spiritual that is sung in the style of surge singing in which the singers and audience feel the experience of yearning for that eventual city called heaven.
We closed this program with the uh, Ballad Hymn of the Republic. And this was actually written during the American Civil War by the abolitionist Julia Ward Howe, who was in favor of the abolition of slavery. So this is frequently performed at patriotic events and other festivals, and some consider it America's finest and most meaningful hymn to it.
this time, I'd like to ask Robert to come on up here. I just recently found out that Robert um, knows the President of the United States. He was at, has been to his house, so. I just thought that was kind of interesting. A, a fun fact. And the former president as well, Obama. Well, I guess you got volunteered to say a few words. <laughs> My commander, when he says, Robert, will you say a few words? Well, you know, it's basically an order, so he just does it in a nice way. Uh, Bob Polachek is our, my commander, and Everett Goodwin is the vice commander. And you give them a hand because they did a lot. Of <laughs> and I was just amazed with uh, with all the brass and music of this orchestra. It, it, it just it's beautiful and touching. And the choir, wow! You know that 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 was something that was uh, really impressive. And as I was listening to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, we all share a spirit. We all share a spirit with our Creator. No matter what the name is, from whatever background you come from, there's only one Creator. And us soldiers, we really believe in that. Because there's a lot of times we, we have, think we were very close to God. So when I first started, here with the drum. It was a prayer song. Get you man into a great spirit. That's what I said. He's like a cloud that passes by that we cannot see. And at the end I said, we will see you again. Because our spirits are recycled. And when I was playing the drum, That's my heartbeat. That's what that symbolizes. And I'm praying to our Creator with my heart. And when our veterans came in, they felt the heartbeat of Mother Earth. That is really important. That's why we're all protectors. We are to protect our home, protect Mother Earth and protect one another with our hearts. I just wanted to say those few words before I uh, read something that I wrote earlier today. Welcome, and thank you all for being here tonight. We want to thank all Native American veterans for their service in the United States. As we all gather in the safety and freedoms, we mark a time of honor and respect in a tradition of bravery and love for one, for the ones that we hold sacred. In 1921, long before we were citizens of the United States. Native people put their lives on the line on the battlefields around the world and here at home. This country is not only our home, but also our homeland. We as Native people serve this great nation of ours in the highest percentages of all ethnic groups. With these extraordinary rates and dedication, we also have secured a national memorial in Washington, D.C. to honor all that have served in the past and that are service today. I want to thank all the armed services for the recognition to protect your freedom and your way of life that our Creator has given to us all. 
On this Veterans Day, we celebrate the lives and survivors of conflicts around the world. And we say to them, thank you, and we love you for protecting us. On Memorial Day each year, we gather to pay respect and honor to all veterans that have received their new orders to be with the Creator on that day. We see honor guards continuing to freely serve our country by presenting the colors to the grave sites and cemeteries to celebrate the lives and sacrifices of those veterans that gave us this day to be here as a free people of the greatest country on earth. Today I proudly stand here with some of the White Earth Reservation Veterans Honor Guard. These men and women continue the tradition of honor, dedication, and volunteerism as they did when they freely signed the blank check to openly put their lives on the line for all of you great Americans and the common bond with all veterans to serve you every day. As we leave this event today, please show your pride and gratitude to all veterans of the armed services in the United States of America. God bless you all.
Well, thank you, everybody. It's been our pleasure to play for you this evening. The next one we're going to do is the Armed Forces Salute. So as you hear your song, if you are a service member, uh, please stand as you are able. I will do my best to announce them at the right time. five or six people from northern Minnesota, North Dakota, Red River Valley, went on the, one, the flight that I went on. Last year, we had 113 out of Grand Forks. This year, we had 108. So we've done a job of raising money so we can send vets to Washington, D.C. So uh, we're just going to give you a couple days. It's an all-volunteer. We have no help from the government to raise money. Uh, it comes out of Fargo. Uh, our job is a nonprofit to send veterans to Washington, D.C. We send them for three days. So we'll introduce ourselves and then tell about our experiences for the last fight we were on. Bill Langley. Give us a little talk. Okay. Uh, I'll say like the comrade over there that 
the band is great, the chorus is great, and I, it's, it's been a very nice evening. Uh, I guess I would like to just remind you that this honor flight, there's, there's, no, there's no monies from the tax pay, uh, payers. I mean, this is all volunteer. It's you, 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 and you that make this all happen. And, you know, uh, we've got, what, 500, 600 guys? You know, about 600 up. people waiting to go, so. You know, so we're, it's not over yet, but someday we're going to catch up on it. But uh, as of now, we've got a long ways to go. But um, I guess my own experience with it is I came back a different person just because of the way we were treated there. It, it uh, total respect. Uh, they waited on you hand and foot. Um, we got to see a lot of memorials that, you know, basically built this country, and I, I go back in a heartbeat, but at the same time, it, it probably wouldn't be as good because uh, the volunteers were just amazing. Um, I guess uh, we're on a limited time here, so I'm gonna let it go, but uh, anyway, thank you for anybody that donated, and please continue helping. My name is Joe Stroop from Euclid. Uh, I went on the flight with these guys uh, two years ago. Great deal. Um, I had a little different experience. I, I actually was out in Washington, D.C. when I was in the Army uh, back in 1969. So I always tell people the Washington Memorial was only this tall. When I was out. <laughs> but uh, so things have changed. Uh, it, it was a good experience for me. I, you know, I was there when I was 19 years old, and it just it didn't have the same meaning as it has for me now. Um, you know, 19 year old, I was interested in other things. I didn't didn't pay a lot of attention to the memorials. This was such a great deal. We, uh, you know, the fact that it was so organized. We had was it four four buses. Everything was taken care of for us, uh, all organized. We went to all of these different memorials. Uh, there were people waiting for us. You wouldn't see that if you went out by yourself, you know, to, to go to these places, uh, the traffic and everything here. Um, it, it was just a great experience, and I would just recommend it to anyone that's even remotely thinking about going. It, it's Bob, I'm talking to you, you know, so. <laughs> That's a guy I'm working on. But uh, it just, it, it was just a great experience. And uh, I, hope, I hope everyone that has an opportunity takes, takes the opportunity to go out there. Uh, like I say, it's all, there's no money involved. You just go, they, they treat you so good. I mean, we, you know, there were people on, on, the, on the flight that were, Handicap. There was. There was. Everything was handicap accessible. The plane. They loaded wheelchairs. Uh, they. They just did everything. Doctors, psychiatrists, uh, nurses were along. I didn't have to worry about anything. It's a great deal. Thank you. My name is James Altspeter. I'd like to uh, just kind of thank the people who have sponsored us in the past. I uh, like the meat plant, they supplied all our jackets, and the motorcycle clubs from Grand Forks, they donated just tons of money, like $20,000 a year, and that's just a small motorcycle club in order that people can go to Washington and enjoy the scenery, enjoy the site, enjoy our history. Uh, I got one little thing I like to talk about. When I was there, I had an experience that I don't think I'd ever forget. I was uh, at the museum for uh, natural history, and we were walking, walking around, enjoying the sights. And uh, I happened to see this this uh, guy walking towards me, and he had a medal of honor around his neck. And I said, my God, you, know, you don't see a guy like that very often. He was just a uh, small guy, oh, probably about 5'8", 
I asked him, I said, how did you win the Medal of Honor? He says, well, I was in combat with the Marines, and uh, our division was attacked by the Viet Cong, and he said most of our division was wounded or killed. And he said he managed to drag seven of his men across the river under fire in order to save them. And that's how you earn a Medal of Honor. Well, I says uh, to him, I said, well, what is your name? And he says, Sammy Davis. I looked at him kind of funny, I thought he was joking. And he says, no, my name is Sammy Davis. He says, I don't sing and I don't dance. <laughs> I'd like to thank you all if you're willing to donate because it's an honorable profession that they're honored, uh, honored the veterans that you don't see too often. I mean, the stuff that they gave us and the return that we all witnessed coming back and we come out of, our, out of Grand Forks and there was like 700 people just waiting there to greet us and thank us for our service and our plane had water cannons shooting over top of us. Motorcycle clubs, like 50 people there from Grand Forks Motorcycle Club just to honor us. It was really a, a thrill just to participate in this honor fight. And the things that we brought back with us, like the others have said, you'll never forget. And it's something that I'd do in a minute if they let you do it again. So I thank you folks for sharing us with us. Bye now. We take 50 wheelchairs on every flight. People, I'm 88 years old, and I can't walk as far as the young people do. So if you need a wheelchair, they push you around. If you need a doctor, we take care of you. Uh, another thing is all memorials. And my daughter got the chance of helping somebody on the honor flight, pushing him around. And he came to the wall, and all 200,000 names on it, and he wanted to scripture or trace his name on there, and she got the privilege of doing that. So, it's a great honor, and I'm with the motorcycle group too, and uh, I get emotional, and uh, it's my privilege to see these vets come back in tears with their eyes. So, thank you very much. Lee Greenwood had a song out and he had said this, I'm proud to be American, where I know I will be free, and I'll stand up next to you with a privilege of dying. Thank you.
so much. What a magical evening. Um, there is many people to thank. Please go to the back of your program to see who they all are. Um, I do want to conclude tonight with knowing that um, we do have some people that are here. If people want to visit more about the honor flight or they want to visit with the color guard, feel free to stay back and they'll be happy to visit with you. Right now, we're going to um, exit the, the colors. Retrieve the colors, sorry. So if you would all stand, please. Anyone there, they'll be around and have a safe drive home. Thank you.